Moncton Homelands Project. Hi, we're here to teach you about Mi'kmaq culture. My name is Arisha and I'm going to talk a bit about some of their traditional land and customs. Mi'kmaq people have always inhabited the traditional territory in the maritime provinces stretching down into the United States. Their traditional economic, social, and spiritual views base leadership not in power, but in the management of hunting, fishing, as well as having a grand council, the traditional governing council of the Mi'kmaq people, which has existed prior to first contact and exists to this day, but has since had its political powers restricted by the federal government, such as in the Indian Act. Though the council is considered the Mi'kmaq people's spiritual authority, which advocates for the promotion and preservation of Mi'kmaq culture and language. Mi'kmaq nations also share close ties and, uh, and alliances with the Maliseet nations. My name is Victoria and I'm going to be talking about the medicine wheel. Okay, so the Mi'kmaq have seven, seven directions, seven sacred directions, sorry, and they believe that all these directions are represented on the wheel. So east and west is the beginning and the end. So the wheel is like a cycle because life begins like spring begins and it ends in the west, like death. So uh, those two sacred directions are east and west. west. And then you have north and south. And um, the only other two are up and down, up towards the sky, down towards Mother Earth, and in towards yourself because you are a part of the cycle, like your own personality and everything. Um, and then, yeah. <coughs> and one of the Mi'kmaq teachings is that the Creator made four sacred colors of man and four elements of life. Each man was given a gift. The red man was given the gift of earth, the white man was given the gift of fire, the yellow man given the gift of air, and the black man given the gift of water. Each holds the responsibility for all living needs, the elements. And the medicine wheel is uh, very complicated, so we couldn't cover everything, but also it's a medicine wheel, so uh, each respective direction and color has their own respective medicines. As pictured here. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to talk about the creation story. So basically, the Mi'kmaq people have a very complicated creation story and uh, based on the seven sacred numbers and the seven stages of creation. So number one is the sky, and the sky is the giver of life, and it's a symbol of mystery, and basically it creates, it's the secret to everything in their universe. So that's why up is a very important direction because it represents the sky. <clears throat> um, number two, Sun creates life and represents, gives us our shadows and reflects our identities and characteristics and spirits of our ancestors. So the shadow that is like reflected onto the ground, it represents who we really are and it is the link between the spiritual and physical world. And then number three is probably the most important for the Mi'kmaq is Mother Earth because on the medicine wheel they, uh, they do assign themselves the element of Earth and um, basically Mother Earth is responsible for creating the rise to life, so uh, it creates everything and every person is a product of Mother Earth. So basically to summarize the entire creation story because it, it's really long, um, the first man was created from a bolt of lightning that struck the surface of the Earth. And the first time the lightning strikes, his life force is created. He is of the Earth. The second time it strikes, uh, the seven sacred parts of his body are created. Two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, and a mouth. The third time it strikes, he is freed from the surface of the earth, and he pays respects to all the directions, and to the sun, and to the sky for giving him life. So, um, <clears throat> basically, this first man is visited by an eagle, and the eagle tells him that he will soon see his family, and his family will be created to teach him, teach him the lessons of life. So their culture is very family orientated. So the first person um, that the man meets is his grandmother and she is created from a rock. And so basically her lesson to her, her lesson to him is to respect wisdom and knowledge that she carries. So it's really important for them to respect their, el their elders. Um, secondly, um, he meets his nephew and his nephew is a creation of the whirlwind and his nephew in his life represents the young feeble spirit of an adventure. So he has the wisdom from his grandmother and then he has the adventure from his nephew. 
and um, the last person that he meets is his mother and his mother is there to act as a sort of guide and teach this man the, the basics of love to understand love and how it works so family is really really important in their culture and basically they say in the creation story that women come first and they come from the water and they nurture all life so his grandmother and his mother are really important to the story but basically the the whole message of everything is that family teaches you all the lessons you need to know in life and that community is the strongest aspect of one's life i guess so yeah yeah the end <laughs> Mi'kmaq, en fait, sont les premiers occupants de la région atlantique canadienne. On les considère comme étant un peuple nomade. Donc, ce sont des gens qui vivent dans les wigwams, donc les transportations qu'on peut apporter d'un endroit à l'autre. Les Mi'kmaq vont principalement vivre de chasse, de pêche. Euh, ils vont aussi euh, essayer de faire des trappes pour euh, attraper les animaux. Puis, euh, on note aussi là, la cueillette de petits fruits. Donc, le territoire euh, traditionnel des Mi'kmaq se nomme le Mi'kma'i, okay? et euh, ils y vivent depuis plus de 10 000 ans. Donc, on note là, que les premiers Mi'kmaq seraient arrivés au Canada depuis euh, 10 000 ans passés. Puis, euh, ils vivaient surtout en bordure de la rivière et des côtes. Les Mi'kmaq dépendent beaucoup des ressources qu'ils qu vont cueillir. Pour ça, qui ne font pas beaucoup de gaspillage alimentaire. Quand les Mi'kmaq vont aller cueillir quelque chose en particulier, bien, ils vont s'arranger pour l'utiliser à toutes ses fins, puis l'aliment en question, en fait, ne se ramasse pas euh, euh, périmé euh, ou dégradé par la nature. Ils vont essayer vraiment de, de le manger. Donc, c'est pour ça qu'on dit que les Mi'kmaq euh, vénèrent beaucoup la terre. Ils ont un lien très, très proche avec celle-ci. Euh, les, les Mi'kmaq vont manger beaucoup de crustacés et euh, petits et grands mammifères marins, donc résultat de leur chasse. Puis, euh, les besoins de base des Mi'kmaq, ben, ça revient un peu à la base euh, de la pyramide de Maslow, donc se nourrir, se loger, se vêtir. Puis pour eux aussi, euh, le déplacement qui est quand même important, l'été en canot, puis l'hiver euh, en raquette. When did the Mi'kmaq first arrive? The Mi'kmaq first arrived 10,000 years ago. Okay. And who were the first settlers to meet them? Where did they meet? When did they meet? And what was their initial relationship like? The French were the first people to meet the Mi'kmaq in a land called Acadia, a large region consisting of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Southeast Quebec, Prince Edward Island, and Eastern Maine. It was technically first settled in 1605, but that first colony was quickly abandoned. Other attempts were made in 1610, but those didn't go much further either due to conflicts with the British in the Anglo-French War. Control of the land would constantly shift between the two until Acadia was returned to France in the Treaty of Saint-Germain-en-Laye in 1632, along with other territories. With the English out of the way, the land could finally be sell properly. In a fortunate coincidence, the first settlements were made along the coast of the Bay of Fundy. The place was absolutely, was incredibly flooded, so they had to uh, pump all the water out. But as a result, they didn't uh, encroach on the forests where the Mi'kmaq lived. Mm -hmm. This led to the relationship being unusually peaceful since they weren't trying to get each other's resources. But those treaties didn't last, did they? No, they did not. The, fr the French and the British were still fighting each other, trying to become the conquerors of the New World. And eventually, uh, the British uh, got Acadia after signing the Utrecht Treaty in 1713. Since the British were now in control, all the treaties that the French made were no longer valid, so new ones needed to get made. This would take 13 years though. Oh, but while that was happening, there was a lot of violence between the British and the Mi'kmaq. It even got to the point where bounties were starting to be made against them. 
Uh, when was the first treaty between the British and the Mi'kmaq signed? It was signed in 1726. It was meant to stop all that shit I was talking about previously. And uh, the British promised the Mi'kmaq that they could hunt and fish without interference. So can you talk uh, to me uh, more about uh, Jean-Baptiste Cope and what did he do? Cope was a Mi'kmaq chief in Nova Scotia. In 1752, he signed a peace treaty with the British to have more rights in regards to fishing and commerce. And if we talk a little bit about the uh, Royal uh, Proclamation, can you tell me what is the big problem with that? Though? The Royal Proclamation in 1763 gave rights to indigenous people in some parts of Canada, but the Maritime wasn't considered to be one of those parts. Naturally, since the people who were in the Maritimes weren't being governed by any proclamations, they had no reason to treat the people who lived there with any kind of dignity. And with the Supreme Court of Canada, in uh, 1985, what happened? happened? Well, at that point, uh, Canada was ignoring a lot of uh, treaties that were signed back in those old days. Like there, These documents are centuries old at that point, so people really did not follow them. What the Supreme Court did was that they said that those documents still matter, that those indigenous people still had rights, and basically it brought the indigenous rights to the modern century. And since October 1st, uh, uh, in uh, 1986, what is um, the new celebration? 1986 is... Tr October 1st is Tree Anniversary Day. On this day, we can commemorate the signing of past trees and the better relationship we have with the Mi'kmaq now. The day is celebrated in Nova Scotia and a few other provinces. Okay, this thing. And uh, recently, can you talk to me about the situation of the Mi'kmaq in the Maritime? In 2016, uh, the Elsie Podtok community brought to light an old title claim they had on part of the, the province called Sikinatuk. And what makes a title claim different from a land claim is that it isn't about acquiring that land as property. A title claim is, instead is about the right to use the resources of the land such as hunting and fishing, as well as having a small say in how it's run. Specifically, the Elsie Poktok community wants to have a greater say in decisions involving the environment, such as pipelines and fracking. Hopefully, this will prevent another. This will prevent the Black Rock from happening again. Mm -hmm. As of 2019, the case is still just being discussed. So, thank you very much. Uh. You're welcome. Okay. Resurgence means an increase or revival after a period of little activity or popularity of occurrence. In terms of our Indigenous people of Canada, an act of resurgence is to sing and dance their traditional dances in order to find their voices and rebuild their culture. It is important for them to be strong and take back what was taken from them in order to preserve their culture. Now we will give an example of a story of Indigenous resistance. Les faits reprochés à M. Johnson remontent au 24 février l'an dernier. À cette date, M. Francis, homme âgé de 22 ans de la Première Nation El Chipoctog, a été happé mortellement par un véhicule qui se trouvait à bordure du chemin Saint-Charles-Sud, près de Ridubucto. Le conducteur de véhicule ne s'est pas arrêté. La camionnette de M. Johnson a été saisie par le lendemain par la GRC dans le cadre d'enquête. Elle a été rendue par la suite. Dans la communauté, l'impatience des amis et de la famille de M. Francis face au délai entre sa mort et le dépôt d'accusation a mené du mouvement. Le mouvement Justice for Brandy. Les vêtements, les autocollants, les affiches portant le visage de Brandy et le nom du mouvement ont rapidement apparu dans la région. De nombreuses personnes ont demandé dans les médias sociaux que la personne responsable du décès de M. Francis avoue son crime. 
une manifestation pacifique sur la rue Main à Moncton en avril 2018 a attribué près de 250 participants. Depuis le début du procès devant la cour, des membres de la communauté d'Elsie Potog s'opposent au fait la procédure ait lieu uniquement en français. Ils demandent à la cour d'offrir une traduction simultanée. Another example of indigenous resistance is the Tiny House Warriors, who are a group of Sequan Pemse land and water defenders who for the past year have been gathered in a new village of tiny houses on Sequan Pemse territory near Blue River, British Columbia. Currently in Alberta, the government is working towards the Trans Mountain Pipeline that will go from central Alberta to the coast of British Columbia. The pipeline is supposed to be going through unceded territory of the Sequan Pemse people of British Columbia. Their act of resistance towards this proposed plan is to build tiny houses along the path of the pipeline in their territory to show that there are actually people residing on this land. Fait que désolé, je vais encore lire parce que c'est pas moi qui ai composé, c'est elle qui a tout fait. Fait que, bon. Il existe de nombreux autres exemples similaires à ceux, dans, oh, ceux de ce cas où des personnes ne sont pas traitées équitablement et que leurs droits qui leur sont conférés ne sont pas respectés. Les Mi'kmaq travaillent d'arrache-pied pour renforcer leur culture chaque jour en se battant pour leurs droits et en partageant leurs cérémonies traditionnelles et en se rendant plus visibles. Voici la fin de notre court petit vidéo. Moi et Théa, à la prochaine, on vous aime.